So thank you all for coming. Tonight, we're doing the big burst pipe, aortic aneurysms and dissection management. All right, so the basics of what an aortic aneurysm actually is. So what we see when we see an aneurysm is there's a balloon-like bulge in the aorta that occurs when the wall of the vessel weakens. And so the uh, aneurysms can occur anywhere in the aorta, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and they can either be round, which are called saccular, or tube-shaped, which is fusiform. So you can see two examples here. This one's more of like that round sac, and then this is more of a tubular form. Now there's two different places that aneurysms can occur. We can have thoracic aneurysms. So a thoracic aneurysm occurs along any portion of the aorta that passes through the chest cavity. So starting at the heart all the way through to the chest cavity. It's a less common type of aneurysm when you compare it to um, the next one, which is abdominal, which we'll talk about in a minute. But as the thoracic aortic aneurysm grows, sometimes patients may report some tenderness in their chest, back pain, hoarseness, cough, for shortness of breath. And you can see here that anything that's in the thoracic area is pretty much anything above the diaphragm, right? In that thoracic space. So the other area that you could have an, uh, an aneurysm is an abdominal aneurysm. So that occurs along the part of the aorta that passes through the, the abdomen, so below the level of the diaphragm. And as that aneurysm grows, some patients can report uh, a deep and constant pain in their abdomen. They may have back pain or they may have a pulse near their belly button. That's kind of the basics of what you can see when somebody says they have an aneurysm. But how does a dissection actually differ from an aneurysm? Because you can have an aneurysm and live with that without um, even knowing it. But a dissection is something that you're definitely going to tell. Well, well that's what we're primarily going to talk about tonight. So remember, if an aneurysm is the bulging of the vessel at a weakened area, a dissection occurs when there is a tear along that innermost layer of the aorta, that's the intima of that aortic blood vessel, that allows blood to flow between the layers of the aortic wall, which forces those layers apart. So you can kind of see a little bit of that in this image here. The tearing of the layers creates this false lumen where blood will flow into rather than flowing through the true lumen, uh, which is the actual aorta. And sometimes what can happen is the blood actually going into this false lumen can be at such high pressure and can cause secondary tears, um, which actually allows some of the blood to re-enter back into the true lumen. And so again, you can kind of see here, you've got that bulging, that weakening of the wall. So that's your aneurysm. And then a tiny tear occurs somewhere along the weakening of the wall. And now you've got blood flowing into that torn area. So it just kind of rips the layers apart. And here's another example of how that false lumen is created. And so when we look at some images later, you're going to see that you can see a true lumen and a false lumen. Um, but again, it just has a little tear. It enters through here. And then this area starts to fill and starts to protrude. And you can guess that if you already have a weakened wall that was already stretched, and now there's a tear in it, and now there's blood pushing into an area that's now um, one layer less than it was before, you really have to be concerned as to how long is that vessel actually going to be able to maintain before you have a rupture. And that's really what we want to avoid. That's the whole point of this is, is avoiding that. So there's a couple of baseline stages that you'll see, but when that intima first ruptures and causes a small tear, that's when you see your stage one, and then the high pressure in the aorta, blood begins to flow into the tear, making it bigger and bigger. And then once those pressures uh, exceed the capability of that already weakened wall that like we were just talking about the vessel rupture. So there's a couple of different classifications that you can actually see with uh, dissections. So the two most common are the Stanford and DeBakey. So Stanford divides aortic dissections into two major groups. There's A and B. And so you can kind of see these are what fits in the A group and these are what fits in the B group. So when you're talking Stanford, the question to ask yourself really is, is the ascending aorta involved or not? So if it's a group A or type A, it's going to involve the ascending aorta and can extend to the aortic arch in the descending aorta. So you can see it involves the arch here. It involves all the way down and through here. So ascending this top portion of the aorta. Okay. Group B doesn't uh, involve the ascending aorta at all. So see here how there's no aneurysm or dissection and this ascending aorta, it's all in the descending. Whereas in this one, there is aneurysms in both the ascending. So that's what makes this type A. And that's what makes that type B. 
So that's really the only question you need to ask for Stanford. And so if you ever hear somebody um, come in or say one of the providers says, oh yeah, you know, that patient has a, a type A dissection, now you'll know that it involves that ascending aorta. Now the debate is a little bit different. It has a little bit more classifications. It groups it anatomically. So a type one originates in your ascending aorta and can extend to about the aortic arch. They're typically seen in patients under, under 65 and they do carry the highest mortality rate. Type two is confined to just the ascending aorta. So you can see again, just the ascending aorta right here. And you can classically see this more in your elderly patients that have a, a long history of hypertension. And then your type three originates distal to the subclavian. So here's the subclavian, so distal to that in the descending aorta. And this where it's further categorized into 3A and 3B. 3A stays within the thoracic cavity, so above the diaphragm. And 3B can actually extend down into the abdominal cavity. So Again, don't really have to remember all the specifics of this, but just kind of understanding um, where the aneurysm or dissection is originating from can help a little bit when it comes to monitoring and caring for your patient. So what kind of risk factors are there um, for patients? And, and this is kind of risk factors is always the little like ding ding in the back of my head when they start giving me a history as to, oh, wow, they have a couple of these risk factors. So I should probably be aware that this could be a potential problem. So um, one thing you can remember is backaches for an acute aortic syndrome. So there is um, quite a list of different risk factors that somebody um, may have in their history that could tell you that this is potentially a problem for them. So individuals with bicuspid aortic valves, they're about 50% more likely to have a thoracic aortic aneurysm. Um, arthrosclerosis is a thickening or hardening of the arteries caused by a buildup of plaque in the inner lining of the artery. And so that's obviously going to cause some um, issue with the vessel itself. And it can, can cause some instability with the vessel wall and weakening. Connective tissue disorders can cause vascular abnormalities. And the big one that we think of is Marfan's. So in Marfan's patients, everything is, I always kind of think of it as um, stretched out. So they're very tall, they have very long fingers. You think of all of that also being in their vasculature, that means that the aorta is very stretched and they're known to have uh, weaker vessel walls. And so if you have a patient with Marfan's um, aneurysms, aortic aneurysms are something that you wanna definitely keep in the back of your mind. Known aneurysms should make you more suspective of a patient and a family history of aortic aneurysms increases the patient's likelihood of having one themselves. Um, arteritis is an inflammation of the arteries and that damages the vessel wall and reduces blood flow. Drugs such as cocaine and uh, crack cocaine can cause significant abrupt hypertension, which causes long-term weakling of that vessel. Because if you think um, significant hypertension, lots of pressure, and then it kind of relaxes, you do that over the course of a, a period of time that can cause problems with the vessel. Hypertension also, and it's seen in about 80% of patients with aortic dissections because of that chronic increased pressure based on the vessels. Um, aortic dissections can occur in the late stages of pregnancy, usually that third trimester, due to the hyperdynamic state and hormonal effect on the vasculature. And cardiac surgery can also put a patient at risk as certain procedures require mechanical manipulation of the aorta, which can cause damage. So there's a lot of different things that you could potentially see, um, but any of these combined with some of the assessment pearls that we're going to talk about in a minute should trigger an alarm in your head that maybe there is something going on that has to do with an aneurysm or dissection. So your pre-hospital slash, I just got to the ED and haven't had a full workup assessment. So what are your physical assessment findings typically in these cases? So there's a couple of pain features and a couple of physical exam findings that are really notable in these types of patients. So chest pain is classically ripping or tearing in nature. And somebody might come in and say, I've got this really sudden, terrible, awful chest pain that's just ripping through my chest. And that type of, of pain, the abrupt onset, severe pain intensity, ripping and tearing, those are kind of like your three hallmarks. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be chest pain. So it's not always going to be chest pain. Um, sometimes they can have retrosternal chest pain, intrascapular pain. They might say they just have the worst pain ever throughout. They might have pain migrating down their back. The hallmarks of this really to focus on are the sudden and awful and ripping, tearing sensation. And when you do your assessment, you might find that there's a pulse deficit 
or a difference between the blood pressures from one arm to the other arm. And this occurs if the dissection occurs in the ascending thoracic area and the subclavian artery is affected. So you can actually see differing pulses and differing uh, blood pressures on either side. And then you can also see some neurological deficits. Um, it can occur for a couple of different reasons. Let's say the dissection was occurring really high up on that ascending aorta and the aortic notch. If it's happening there, it could actually dissect up in the carotids and you can have a patient that is mimicking signs of a stroke. It could be neurologic changes in the arms or legs. So if you think as it comes down the aortic arch into the descending aorta, the subclavians come off of that. And so if you've got a dissection into the subclavian, then you can have um, neuro deficits in one of the arms. If you have an abdominal aneurysm that's compromising blood flow to the lower part of the body, then you can have numbness, tingling, or sensation changes in the lower extremities. So essentially what you try to think of is wherever the aorta may be uh, tearing and having a dissection, you should see some type of damage or evidence of compromised blood flow distal from that site. And again, when you're in your initial stages of assessment, you don't have that CT to be able to say, yes, I have a descending aortic thoracic aneurysm. But based off of your assessment that you do, if you've got differing pulse pressures um, on either arm and you've got this ripping, tearing, worst pain of my life, chest pain, you might be able to fairly confidently say, hey, this is really high up on my differential list and this is what I'm concerned about. That hypotension and shock light state that you can see as the physical exam findings um, can be due to the fact that a large amount of the blood is being rerouted from the main pipe in the body. And the body then tries to compensate by increasing blood pressure or heart rate, which will worsen the problem and eventually cause them to be hypotensive and in a shock light state. Um, and once they get into that shock like state, it, it's a little bit more difficult to manage in some ways um, because their status is very tenuous. You don't want to put any additional pressure on that uh, aorta on the blood vessel. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how we, how we maintain that um, coming up in a little bit. EKGs. So like we talked about, patients come in complaining of chest pain. How can you differentiate if it's a MI versus a aortic aneurysm uh, or a dissection? And you really can't use this as a great indicator. What I will say is um, EKGs and dissection patients are usually normal. So if you have somebody coming in with this ripping, tearing chest pain, you do an EKG and it's perfectly fine then maybe you start going away from the MI thought process and start going into the um, uh, thoracic aortic dissection thought process. However, if a dissection occurs up high enough in that aortic route, it can actually mimic the signs of a heart attack if the aorta starts to dissect back into the coronary arteries. So if you think about it, when you've got your aorta, you have that little tear. Well, most of the time the tear, it starts to go this way, but it can actually start to tear a little bit backwards. And so you can actually see tearing back into the vessel that it's connected to. And the aorta connects to the coronary. So you just kind of see it pop back there. And if you start dissecting into your coronaries, you're compromising the blood flow. Now, what is an MI? It's compromised blood flow. Now, usually it's more caused from something like a blood clot or a plaque rupture, but it's still compromised blood flow. So you could have an EKG that can mimic an MI. And if you do see that, most commonly, you'll see a the right coronary artery involved. So you'll usually see an inferior pattern, but not always. Um, now, the worry here is, is that if you treat the patient as an MI and not as a dissection, so let's say you just get the EKG and you don't go any further and you decide, oh, we're gonna give thrombolytics because we can't get them to the cath lab for the next you know, three hours and we're gonna give them thrombolytics to fix this MI, and they're not an MI, their mortality increases to over 70% if they get those thrombolytics. And that's just because the increased risk of bleeding into the pericardial sac, which will cause um, cardiac tamponade. High dissection, again, can also dissect up into the uh, carotid arteries. So you can also have patients that look like they're having a stroke. Um, so just remember that usually the EKG is normal, but even if you have an EKG, you still want to make sure that you rule out a potential aortic dissection. We'll talk about how we can do that in a, in a couple minutes. The differential diagnoses that you should be thinking of whenever you encounter a patient like this, because dissections can mimic a lot of other diagnoses. So you want to make sure you rule out other things such as an MI, PEs, pericarditis, um, stroke. Again, if you dissect up into the um, carotid arteries, it can look like you're having a stroke. Kidney stones, because people complain of um, flank pain 
uh, musculoskeletal back pain. So you want to look at the whole picture. You've got their history, what their physical assessment findings are, how they're describing their pain, any other related complaints that they have um, to really make sure that you have a good picture. And once they get into the ED and we can start doing a full workup, that's going to include things like labs. So you would expect to see, um, and not always, but expect to see a leukocytosis. So that's increased level of leukocytes, a type of white blood cell. And you might see a positive D-dimer, which is increased when blood clots are dissolving. Um, and that's just because you've got that false lumen. And so when you have that false lumen, it's really just kind of like blood pooling in that area. It's not actively going anywhere. And so that can cause your D-dimer to rise. Your creatinine may be elevated if your renal arteries are involved. A triponin can be elevated if the dissection is within the aortic root and extending back into the coronary arteries. Um, labs may come back fairly relatively normal, though. So don't think that if all the labs come back, you're off the hook. You definitely want to dig a little bit deeper if the physical assessment findings and um, some of the other things that you're seeing are concerning for a dissection. And when you draw your labs, just make sure you get a type and screen that you have just in case. So uh, you don't have to worry about getting that again later. Imaging is really the big one though that we're kind of going to, to get our answers. Sometimes what'll happen is we'll start with just a chest X-ray, especially when you have that patient that comes in and they say, I'm having chest pain. Maybe they have a history of cardiac issues. You're kind of thinking like, I really think this is an MI. I see an inferior wall MI on my EKG. But, you know, they had a family history of aortic aneurysms. And so I really just want to make sure this isn't a dissection. Maybe I'll just get a quick chest X-ray. So what do you actually see on a chest X-ray? Well, if they have a thoracic aortic dissection, you'll see a widened mediastinum and an abnormal aortic contour. So if you look here, you can see that this is a normal uh, chest X-ray, right? So you've got this like nice shape of the heart here. Um, the aortic notch appears to be normal. And you look over here and this mediastinum is nice and, <laughs> I won't say nice and wide, but it's widened. Um, and you can see that this aortic notch here now looks a little bizarre compared to what it looked like before. So you would see this and think there's something else going on there. Now I need to investigate and dig a little bit further here. Now, only about 20% of aortic dissections or about 20% of aortic dissections aren't detectable on a chest X-ray. And if you think about it, if you have any type of abdominal um, aortic dissection, you're not gonna see it on a chest X-ray. You're also probably not gonna have the complaints of the chest pain. You'll have pain, complaints of flank or back pain. Um, but if you do that chest X-ray and you don't see anything, but you still have a really high suspicion that there could be something going on, then you wanna do a CT before you would consider something more invasive like thrombolytics. And with the CT, you can really get a nice clear image. So it's the best type of imaging for diagnosing an aortic dissection because when the contrast is given, the scan follows the contrast as it flows to the vessels, right? And what happens is the um, contrast makes the blood like bright white. So it's really easy to track it and see if it's flowing into areas that it's supposed to or areas that it's not supposed to. And so what you can see on these images is that that brighter white portion of the vessel, that's your true lumen. So that's the actual aorta. And the lighter grayed area is the false lumen. Because if you think about it, when you inject it, that blood is flowing through the body, is flowing through the true lumen. But the false lumen is just kind of collecting like some of that side blood, or it might just started um, pooling in that area and it's not actually getting back into the circulation. So it's just pooled there. So that's why you have different coloring. And so a CT actually has a sensitivity of 96 to about 100%. So it's really the gold standard for determining if you've got any type of aortic dissection or not. The disadvantage though to a CT is that you need to do it with contrast. And if you have a patient in florid renal failure, you can't give them contrast. Um, and so there can be a little bit of challenge in that. Um, and more for the cardiac surgeons, they can't actually identify specifically where the tear is. So it can make it a little bit harder for them to come up with their surgical plan. But for us, that's not really our problem. Our problem is saying, yes, this is a dissection. This is something I'm concerned about. And again, you can really see some pretty impressive imaging out there of actual dissections. Because if you look at this one, this is your true lumen and this is your false. And your false looks pretty big compared to that true. And here's just another example again. This is the true lumen and this is the false lumen. So you can see how much blood actually collects in that false track. Um, and then you can imagine why it becomes such an issue for their hemodynamics. Um, and you want to make sure that that wall stays intact and doesn't rupture. 
So that's what we're going to talk about with our management. So initial bedside management, what do we do when we first get this patient and we get that CT back and we're like, yep, okay, this is what we're seeing and this is what we're doing. We're moving forward with treating them for any aortic dissection. So the biggest thing that we want to do initially is to control pain, prevent nausea, and lower that blood pressure in the heart rate. So we do that by, um, like every other patient, starting large bore IVs, drawing labs, making sure we get that type and screen again, if we have a consideration for a dissection. We wanna fluid resuscitate as necessary, but we wanna consider blood early um, and only use crystalloids as needed. Because if you think about it, if we flood the body with saline and it's actually oozing and losing blood um, within that aortic area, we're just replacing it with saline that doesn't have oxygen carrying capability. So if we know that it's a dissection and we're seeing that they're hypotensive and we think that they need volume resuscitation, ideally we would be giving blood products. We wanna make sure we give medications to control pain, uh, control nausea and get that heart rate and blood pressure down. And then we wanna call and get them transferred someplace with a cardiothoracic surgeon who can make a determination as to um, if they're a surgical candidate, if they're not, if they need to be medically managed, but that's not something that we would necessarily keep here. So if we get started first off with just our pain and nausea control, because these are, it's a pretty important concept. So when you're doing pain or nausea control, consider fentanyl or Dilaudid, or you could try morphine for pain control. You don't want to use ketamine. I know that uh, ketamine has been pushed a lot as a popular medication, that it's safe, that it doesn't uh, cause hemodynamic changes. And, you know, all of that is somewhat true and somewhat not true, depending on your patient's status. Um, but if you give ketamine to a patient with dissection, it can have a very unwanted catecholamine surge uh, that could potentially worsen your dissection and lead to a rupture. So we avoid ketamine in these patients. You want to try and prevent nausea the best that you can. Um, you have Zofran, promethazine. And keep in mind that Narcotics and promethazine, uh, phenergan, same thing, do have a synergistic effect. So if you give them together, they can make somebody a little bit more on the sleepy side than you maybe initially intended. Um, not that that necessarily is always a bad thing, but you just really want to make sure you keep that in mind. So what I used to do when I gave prometh for um, these patients or really any patient is I would usually take whatever my narcotic dose was to so say I normally did 100 mics in patients. I'd cut that in half to about like 50. And then I would give about five milligrams of promethazine IV and give them both nice and slow through a wide open line so that they didn't get full as really quickly. Give it a couple minutes and the two of them work really nicely together. Again, that's a total Danielism. Follow either you know, your state guideline or your provider order and, and how they want um, the medications given and what medications to pick. But really just keep in mind that Phenergan works great for nausea. Um, but when you do give it with a narcotic, it does have that synergistic effect. And then you want to make sure that you dilute it and you give it through a really well working IV because it can cause a lot of um, issues if the IV is infiltrated and you give it into the tissue. Um, it can cause pretty severe tissue necrosis. So just be very cautious and mindful when using it. Um, Zofran is another option. Zofran usually works more for like a chemical induced nausea. So somebody that say, got fentanyl and then says, now I feel really kind of nauseous or um, chemotherapy. And so it tends to work better for that more so than an acute nausea, but it's a backup option and it really doesn't have um, many negative reasons to not giving it. So you know, sometimes you will see that. And you know the, the reason that we wanna focus on making sure that they don't get nauseous is that the act of vomiting can cause an increase um, intrathoracic pressure that can actually rupture a dissection. And we wanna try to avoid that. And it can be hard because depending on where the dissection is, you can actually um, dissect in a way that causes nausea. Uh, and that's not going to be mitigated with any type of a, a chemical substance like Zofran or promethazine. So you just do the best that you can. Sometimes even just simple fanning of the patient can be enough to keep the nausea at bay. And the really important thing is their heart rate and their blood pressure control. These are kind of like the if I can't stress management enough in these patients, it's getting these numbers down. Um, whoop, man, jump too fast. So aortic dissections, a lot of times when they come to the emergency room or when they're pre-hospital, they actually present as a hypertensive emergency. Um, and so what you really wanna make sure that you do is 
get that heart rate and blood pressure under control is because you want to decrease the shear stress in the aortic wall by decreasing that blood pressure and the heart rate. So ideally, if you can get your systolic between about 100 and 110 and your heart rate less than about 60 beats a minute, uh, you're putting it yourself in a really good place because that's decreasing the amount of pressure in the aorta itself, which is helping to decrease the worsening of that dissection. And there's two really great uh, medications that you can use for this, either um, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So beta blockers are really the first line treatment as they have the ability to both simultaneously lower that heart rate and lower that blood pressure. Now, Esmol is associated with a more rapid onset and is a little bit more easily titratable than other beta blockers. So it's preferred in aortic dissection. So it, it's really common to see Esmolol used in these patients. This infusion guide is something that, um, there was a similar one made at Dartmouth and then we kind of edited it to make it work for us here. But this is a brief breakdown of how you use Esmolol. So we do now have pre-mixed bags of Esmolol here and it's the 2.5 grams and 250 mLs. And what you need to do is figure out what your patient's weight is because it's weight-based. And some providers will order a loading dose, some won't. It's, it's kind of um, provider preference and patient situation. And if you do do a loading dose, then this chart kind of helps you figure out how many mLs that you need to actually administer from the bag itself. So the, the reason that it's set up this way is so that you don't have to pull out an additional vial and try to figure out the concentration of the vial and did I pull out the right amount of mLs. You actually just take a syringe and go to that distal top port on um, your IV tubing and you would pull out the appropriate amount of mLs. And so that's why I broke it down into five kilo increments from 45 up to 100 kilos. So that you can look and say, I have a 75 kilo patient. I would expect them for a loading dose to get 3.75 mLs. This infusion area down here um, is really just a backup for you to look at to compare with your pump. The pump is programmed to run Esmolol. If you put in the 50 mics per kilo per minute at 75, then you're going to get this 22.5 mLs per hour. You don't necessarily have to figure it out. But because Esmolol is not used very often, and it, it is something where you want to make sure that you're um, using the dosing correctly because it can cause pretty significant swings if we do an inappropriate dose. This is just kind of like a nice extra guide to be able to look at to make sure that you're, you're following the right trajectory. It does start at 50 mics and then you titrate up by 50, um, usually every, you know, about five minutes or so based off of what their, their blood pressure and their heart rate looks like. And you can titrate up to the next, the next level. Um, once you get to 300, you're maxed out. And so if you get to that point, or let's say the patient has contraindications to getting a beta blocker, then you can move to a uh, calcium channel blocker. So there's two really big ones that we see fairly often, right? Diltiazem, Cardizem, and Nicardipine or Cardine. Um, and they help to assist to lower the heart rate and the blood pressure because they do have a combined vasodilator and a negative ionotropic effect. But you know, remember the goal is to get that blood pressure and heart rate down to reduce that shearing force um, that the left ventricle is putting out. And so if we need to escalate to using a second medication to help to get that pressure down, then that's something that we, we want to do. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind if you get to the end of your Esmolol or if you can't use Esmolol for some reason in that patient, um, that this can be another beneficial backup option. And then kind of gets down to that's everything that we can do to manage them here. So we get transferred and then what happens next is either they could be medically managed um, or they could have surgical interventions. And so there are a couple of different indications for surgical management. Um, if they have an acute proximal aortic dissection, um, an acute distal aortic dissection with one or more complications and a complication is essentially just a compromise in a vital organ impending rupture of the aorta and uh, retrograde dissection back up into the ascending aorta. So those would all be reasons that would warrant a surgical management approach. And you can see if you've got compromise to a vital organ by you know, your urine output, um, that tends to be a really key one. You can see here in this picture, it, it's showing the renal arteries and the renal vein and kind of where they have the bypass graft done. But if the dissection occurred here, 
and now you're not getting blood flow to your kidneys and you've got compromised um, vital organ blood flow, then that's an indication to, to do something surgical. So the objective in a surgical management of a dissection is to actually remove the most severely damaged segments of the aorta um, in order to uh, get rid of that false lumen because we just want to make sure that that false lumen doesn't stay and wherever that tear is gets removed so that it can't potentially um, open back up and tear again. So there's a couple ways that they do it. Um, they can do endovascular repairs. They can do a full open surgery. Uh, it kind of depends on the patient's status and what it is that they need. And post-op management usually includes strict blood pressure control, um, frequent narrow checks and CSM checks, and then just kind of your standard um, post-op care. But again, this isn't something that we would be seeing here, um, but it's sometimes just kind of nice to know what happens once they end up going to another facility. All right, guys, does anybody have any questions? We went through this one pretty quickly tonight, but uh, the aorta is a single vessel, so.